All right. Well, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to this month's webinar for Fundraising Academy. And today we are talking about events, goal setting strategies. So events are an important tool for fundraisers and can have immense impact. And I know from previous experience that a strategic event can offer so many relationship building opportunities. It can create chances for you to connect with your constituents and involve the community that you serve. So today we're going to be diving in how you can re-evaluate your organization's event strategies and how goal setting can help you and your team produce just an event that maximizes all of your strategies. So a little bit about me. Hello, my name is Sarah Wu. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the program manager at Fundraising Academy and will serve as your moderator today. I have the pleasure of um, being here and serving Fundraising Academy. Um, if, Wuhi, you want to go to the next slide, I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about Fundraising Academy, what we do for those of you who are the first time joiners to our Fundraising Academy webinar series. Uh, Fundraising Academy ed cause selling education prepares you and prepares nonprofit emerging fundraising leaders for greater measurable impact by providing learning opportunities designed to enhance your cause, enhance your community and overall the world. So we're so excited to host today's webinar and elevate the voices of some esteemed colleagues I have on this call. Um, before we get started, I do want to give the group a couple of notes. This webinar will be conversational with the opportunity to ask questions during as well um, at the end with our Q&A function. Please go ahead and submit any questions you have for our panelists using the Q&A so that myself and our two wonderful guest speakers will be able to see them. Also, for all learners of different um, abilities, we have closed captioning available for this webinar. So you'll go ahead and click the CC option in your Zoom controls if you would like to utilize that. The caption size can be adjusted in your video settings under accessibility. And lastly, because we always get to this question, in the days following the webinar, you will receive an email with the link to access both the slide deck and the recording to review again at your leisure. So with that next slide, Muhi, I am pleased to announce our presenters today. Um, Muhi Kwaja and Laura Rice, they are fantastic. They are incredible fundraising professionals. And um, fun fact, they actually both worked together at the Red Cross in a past life. So they are reconvening here for a little reunion session at Fundraising Academy to share their incredible knowledge about relationship-driven fundraising and events. Muhi Kwaja is a trainer for Fundraising Academy and also serves as the co-founder and director of development and philanthropy for the American Muslim Community Foundation. Please welcome Muhi to the stage. Um, and here next to next to Muhi is Laura Rice. Uh, she's an instructor for Fundraising Academy and she serves as the senior director of sustaining philanthropy at the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. So Pleasure to have you both. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Laura to kick off our webinar with the objectives. Hello, everybody. So glad to have you with us today. Um, thank you for spending some time with Fundraising Academy for this webinar. We look forward to hearing your questions. Today, we are gonna talk about using events as a tool for relationship-driven fundraising. Um, this is gonna include talking about our how to build an effective event strategy and what your goal should be, what that means for you and for your organization. And we'll also be discussing how to equip your team with questions to evaluate your annual annual event calendar. Um, I know the zoo has been going through a little bit of a renaissance and so there's been a lot of how we used to do things and so we've been looking at how to do them maybe the ways we do now and as we all know the last few years have uh, definitely caused us to pivot and pirouette to try things in new ways. So as we get started um, let's move on to our first poll. We're going to ask you to please share with us how many donor events your organization plans per year. Year. For this purpose, um, the any event that supports our fundraising goals are what we want to be looking at. 
Um, so this can be a cultivation event, an, an event with an actual solicitation in it, uh, salons and homes, lunches with your CEO, whatever is the right answer for your organization. So you'll have just about 15, 20 more seconds to answer that so we can make sure that we're able to address our topic today specifically to your needs. Yep, and we have about 70% of participants uh, chiming in on the poll. And I have to say, it breaks my heart that five have said zero. But we're yes. here to support those five. Yeah, we're here yeah, to support totally, you and figuring totally. out how to plan a strategic event. So thank you so much for participating yes. in our poll. We are here for you. <laughs> and that's why you're here, so that you can learn these amazing tip, tips. So. Thank and for, for those here. folks in particular, I would love to request you shy away from your really helpful board member who wants you to do a golf tournament. <laughs> um, most folks have no idea how much effort actually goes into an event, folks outside of the system. Mm -hmm. So a golf tournament is one of the most labor intensive ways you can get your to your fundraising goals. Um, so uh, for especially for you guys starting at zero, maybe not the thing you want to launch with. <laughs> All right, we've got everyone in with the poll, and I will be sharing our results of the poll. Laura, do you mind reading out what we found? Not at all. So we've got the majority of folks in the four to five range, um, with one to three being close behind, six to nine beyond that, and then just a few of us with 10 plus. I will share the zoo is obviously a bit of an anomaly, um, but we have three events teams at the zoo, one that does our um, events like Jungle Bells that are zoo wide. We've got our event sales team who does weddings and corporate stuff. And then my own team does over 130 events a year. So we are on the high end of what this looks like. Um, but the good news is we have lessons learned uh, for the whole spectrum. So we look forward to sharing that with each of you today. Yeah, and even at American Muslim Community Foundation, we're a small nonprofit. So, you know, some some years we might do one to three, other years it might be six to nine. Um, and we have done things that were virtual, things that were like stewardship focused, things that were more cultivation focused. Uh, but at the Red Cross, you know, we had our gala, we had a breakfast, we had smaller events. Um, so yeah, definitely I've seen a wide range with organizations that have varying budgets as well. Awesome. Thank you, Muhi and Laura. So I'm going to turn the next section, thank you so much all for filling out the poll, over to Muhi, our um, trainer for today's webinar, to talk a little bit about Fundraising Academy's cause selling cycle. Thank you. So some of you are familiar with this because you have been here before, uh, but for those of you whose first time it is, or maybe it's been a while since you've joined us, here's a little refresher. So the cycle includes three phases with eight essential steps. Um, so step one in, is all about prospecting, which really means you get to find those qualified donors and determine their propensity to give to your organization. The pre-approach is about preparing to make that great first impression by learning more about your prospect and setting up your approach. And the approach is really what you say, when you say it, how you say it, where the location and setting is when you approach that donor, what you're wearing and all of those things um, to determine a pr donor, uh, prospective donor's first impression of you and the organization. Step four is need discovery. And this is thought of as the heart of the process. This step allows us to be asking the meaningful questions and learning more about the donor and really actively listening to build trust and learn key information about your prospective donor. Um, the presentation, this is where you communicate your cause and you demonstrate your impact and ensure that your presentation is tailored to each prospect. Um, and usually in the presentation or in the approach is where these events come into play as well. Um, so step six, everyone's favorite, is handling objections. And this is about embracing objections and really seeing them as an opportunity to get closer to a gift rather than an obstacle. Um, it's about addressing and understanding the concerns presented by your prospective donor to deepen the relationship and remove any roadblocks that you may have. 
making the ask. This is sometimes where board members shake in their boots. They hate this part. However, get your board members comfortable. Get your teammates comfortable about developing a relationship with your prospective donor and understanding how their needs and interests and passions all align with your organization's mission. These people want to support. They need to be asked to support. Otherwise, they will never give at the level that they can aspire to give at. Um, so the moment you are poised to make your ask, you can do it with confidence and success through this cost selling cycle. Um, and then stewardship, um, that is the final step in it. And it's the importance of fostering loyalty, deepening the connection, um, and being able to be a strong, uh, being able to provide strong donor stewardship practices within your organization to deepen the relationship. And it's all about making your donor feel valued and informed on how their donation is being invested by your organization. So again, events can be at various parts of the cycle, most typically the approach, the presentation, the ask and stewardship. So we're gonna dive into who should be at your events. Um, typically speaking, events can impact all phases of cost selling, uh, but again, today we're really going to focus on that prospecting and stewardship. Um, when you deep dive through your uh, customer relationship management database, um, who can you find in there? Um, are there people who have registered for past events? Are there people who uh, live near the zip code of where your event is being held? Um, you really want it serve this initial approach um, and opportunity to engage your potential donors in um, this opportunity as a get to know you type of thing, because every event you can share again what your mission is, what your vision is, um, and how you want to engage those donors and what the look and the feel of the event is as those donors arrive and what the outcome will be and what the feeling the donor should be inspired with at the end of the org, uh, event. So all of these things are part of the event setting strategies and goals that you should have for your event. And it starts with the audience, who is going to be there. Um, a lot of the times you will want to look at your donor lists and you want to see who are those donors who have um, given in the past but not recently. Who are those donors who um, have given earlier this year and you can really steward and foster the relationship by introducing them to a volunteer, a beneficiary, a board member, a staff member, um, and so on and so forth. Yeah, one thing I wanted to add on this piece is you want to think about Who's going to if who's going to get this event invitation and if you haven't talked with them about it if they don't know it's coming that they're going to be like wait why didn't they talk to me like why didn't I know this why was this a surprise. So you want to be sure that your key donors have the chance to be engaged with the event, if that's something they'd be of interest you know if they want to be part of the honorary committee or your event committee or such. Or if it's just a heads up for them, this is coming, be on the lookout. You want to make sure that you provide those cultivation and stewardship touches um, so that everybody who's part of your hug still feels that connection with your organization. Definitely. So really, a qualified prospect, this is somebody who uh, wants to spend time with the organization, hopefully learn more about the cause and why it's important in the community. Um, and when we talk about qualified prospects, these are often people who have the capacity to give, they have the ability to make the giving decision, um, they have an interest in learning more about your mission and vision, and sometimes there's an existing relationship with the organization. Um, and oftentimes those people in leadership positions at the organization can help deepen that relationship and put them in a position where you as a major gift officer or development staff can really foster a relationship and give them more information. 
Because again, not everybody is going to be comfortable with making the ask. It's our responsibility as relationship managers to help facilitate the best experience for that potential donor. Um, so yeah, you want to be, oh, I'm sorry, Muhi. Yeah, um, on ahead. that, I wanted to add, I mean, you're going to have people who maybe buy a table to your event and they're putting, filling it with their friends and their colleagues. And they might say, oh, Laura, you're really going to want to talk to Sandy. Sandy and Chris have loved the zoo a long time and this is their first event. That's that person giving you that clue that this is a really great prospect and that they'd be happy to be part of that conversation. Again, not for the ask, but for the introduction and for you to help connect with them. So you want to have your antenna up for the folks who do that naturally so that you can, <laughs> very nice, um, so that you can be sure that you do follow up with the people who are most likely to be interested. Great point. Um, and, you know, when we look at our donor base, of course, maybe there's a $20 donor a month, um, but we haven't done more research on them. Um, or there's a person who gave $10,000 one year and hasn't given since, you know, it's been two years since. What are those little nuggets of data that you can look at to help you through this process? Um, and that's why having a powerful CRM that can run these types of reports for you and deep dive into these things and do wealth screening and all of those aspects are so important for organizations to take time and invest in a CRM that allows you to get better analytics and get a better pool of qualified prospects for you to then put into a portfolio uh, and develop uh, relationships with. So, you know, really there's so many different methods to prospect and the strongest, the strongest methods are by far and away the first two, these referrals and influencers. Uh, we're gonna spend a few minutes talking about how to get referrals and we will do an activity, like uh, there's activities that you can do with your board members, with your staff members around centers of influence. Like who are they connected to? Who do they know? Um, and then these are things that you should look into um, and exercises that you can try to do to break the monotony of day-to-day -day work, but really engage board members into development, engage your staff members into development. So I would highly recommend trying to look at who's in their network. If you're not connected with all of your staff members and board members on LinkedIn, I would highly recommend that using LinkedIn as a resource to put in a donor's name and see if they're a first connection, a second connection, um, see how they're connected to your personal network. These are all things that we should be doing. Um, and each of these different methods, of course, today's about events. So we're gonna solely be focusing on that. And hopefully in the future, we have different sessions on these different methods of prospecting as well. Laura, anything to add? Yeah, I love your point on the LinkedIn connections. I think too, as you're working with your board, keep in mind that this isn't gonna be every board member's jam. Some board members are gonna lean into this and feel comfortable with it. And there's others who you're, it's gonna be so much hesitation and thinking about strengths and thinking about um, the different ways that folks can support an organization. You don't need to have every board member follow the exact same pattern on this. Give them a little bit of grace and let those who are more inclined to have that social circle and those conversations be the ones that you spend more of your time with. That said, if you have a particular prospect in mind and you know that he and your board chair go golfing, certainly have that conversation and see what, what the appropriate ways might be to open that door. And then maybe they can do a golf event for you. Since exactly. Yeah. <laughs> a complimentary golf tournament that the golf course puts on for you. Exactly. Um, so again, we're, we're highly focused on referrals and we can deep dive here and look into why referrals are so powerful. Um, and again, whether it's somebody connected to your organization um, or even another prospect who hasn't given to your org but feels good about you and your organization and they can make a connection for you. Um, and the fact that this prospect makes that introduction is huge on their part. Um, so what is that leverage that we're looking for? 
um, they're usually willing to make initial contact for you, make an introduction, allow you to use their name. Oh, so-and-so said that it would be good to reach out. That's the leverage that hopefully you can use in a cold email, a cold phone call. Uh, but you want that warm referral. Uh, that's always best, you know. And the reason why referrals work is because uh, people are often naturally skeptical or fearful or like, why is this person contacting me? But if it comes from somebody else, they're more open to that and can be generally persuaded to get to learn about an organization or a cause. Um, and again, like as a fundraiser, I never think that I'm begging or being annoying or being pesky. It's really the mindset that you hold. Um, you are sharing an opportunity for somebody to make a difference in a mission and in a cause. Um, and research often shows that most corporate and individual donors are happy with the organizations that they support and they give high marks to their program services. So if those donors feel confident in your organization and you've done a decent job at cultivation, at stewardship, um, more often than not, if you ask a donor for that referral or, you know, five people in your network that you think would be interested in supporting, they'll make the effort in doing so. And the opportunity here is that you are inviting them to expand the circle of supporters around a cause that they already care about. Um, and by helping them invite their friends, you're also supporting their social stature. Um, Oftentimes, if somebody is passionate about a cause, there's some linkage there to the organization. And if it's a personal one, if it's one that they are deeply involved with, maybe it will lead to them volunteering. Maybe it will lead to them being engaged with your organization in another way outside of being a donor. And that can help them become a monthly donor, a major donor, somebody who leaves uh, your organization in their will. So if we don't take these opportunities to engage them around referrals and other things, they'll only always ever just be a donor to your cause. But you want to find ways to deepen their relationship with your organization. And sometimes that's through an event. Hey, can you get a table? Can you invite five other friends to the organization and get to learn about them? These are ways that they can deepen their relationship with your organization. Um, so centers of influence, similar, like when we talked about like talking to your board members and staff members about who do they know, um, you know, figure out who is a believer in the work your organization does. Um, are there influential, are these people influential with other people in the community? Um, and can they give you those names of other people and help you qualify them? Um, that is essentially the essence of a center of influence. Um, now, this method of prospecting is a specific application of the referral method. It takes it a step further. And in both of these worlds, you begin with a donor or a person whose interest in your organization has developed over time to the point of where they can help you more than just a monetary donation. Um, so it, you know, it's not the first thing you ask them in that donor meeting. It's like maybe a follow-up and something that after they make their first donation or second donation, or you've noticed they've been uh, a donor for five years and you haven't had that conversation. I'm sure at that point, they would be more willing to refer, help you refer to other people. Um, and it's, it's the influence can be far more than just more prospects and they could be more willing to help you provide you names on a continuing basis. So it's not just a one and done deal. Um, so be bold in how you engage your donors and have this as part of the strategy for your donor portfolio. Getting and acquiring new donors is so critical for organizations, but we also know that retaining donors is a far critical uh, strategy for your organization. Um, and again, a great way to do that is through events. Um, so now, um, you know, anything else that you'd like to share, Laura? 
Yes, thanks, Muhi. And um, one thing on this is also don't just limit yourself to your donors. Think about your staff. I had a board, uh, excuse me, I had a CEO who was so well connected in town. He had been in the community space for a very long time, was best buds with the former police chief, all that kind of thing. And we, we finally decoded if he said someone was a friend, he knew them casually and could approach them. If they were a very good friend, it meant that they had served on at least five boards together. So he knew everyone. So going over our top prospect list and those who we were trying to approach with him was critical and an invitation from the CEO went a really long way. So keep in mind this, not just for your board, but if there's movers and shakers who are on your staff, don't leave them out. Critical, critical. And yeah, it's finding those nuggets in organizations. And, you know, oftentimes some staff members may not think they're well connected, um, but it, when you actually have a conversation with them, then they realize, oh, I actually do know people who might be interested in supporting. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be somebody with a high net worth value. It doesn't have to be somebody um, that can volunteer 10 hours a week. It just needs to be somebody who may be interested in learning more about the organization. So it's a good place to start from there. And hopefully you find those nuggets, those diamonds in the rough later. So, you know, regardless of what size of organization you have or the type of donors in your database, you can always find prospects. Um, those reports that you can pull from your database will help you dig those diamonds in a rough. Um, and if you don't have a, a powerful CRM, do your best. Try to pull queries from a report in Excel. Uh, try to uh, look at what's in your QuickBooks or in your uh, accounting software. Um, I've been at organizations that were working out of Excel, like everything you can do to find those opportunities um, and to find those prospects, um, you know, look again for the side bun and the lie bun, some, some year, but not every year or last year, but not this year. And you want to look into those reactivated donors, like somebody who gave two years ago, but then didn't give for the last two years and then gave again this year. Like what inspired them to give? Did they just forget? Were they going through a financial hardship? Like you don't know unless you ask the donors about why they gave the first time and why they continue to support. These are all great questions that you should ask in those discovery meetings when you talk to your donors. And, you know, a major donation for the University of Michigan when I was there, it was $100,000. Uh, when I was at the Red, when Laura and I were at the Red Cross, it was $2,500. Uh, for other charities, I've seen it at $10,000. So when you look at your donor history, who are those donors in those categories uh, that have dropped off? Who are those donors at smaller levels that you can re-engage? Um, and what does the wealth screening say, data say as well? So I always love looking for those A-level prospects. Who are the people who've given the last three years in a row without an increase? Why is that critical? They've given, you know, $1,000 for the last three years. And they're just simply giving you $1,000 every single time uh, without much solicitation. There's an opportunity there for you to be bold for you to have a conversation with them around, can they increase their commitment? Um, so these are all things that we should be looking for as little nuggets in our database of, these are potentially people that we can increase their giving. So then you have like B and C level prospects. Um, and you know we wanna focus on relationship building um, and, you know, Again, look at the zip code um, of where your event is. You want to make sure that those people get an invite. You want to look at who is giving, um, who is frequently buying tickets to past events, who's frequently been a high bidder, not even necessarily who's won the items, but who is, who's been making that capacity to give. And there's technology all around this. And if your organization hasn't used uh, technology around the bidding when it comes to live auction, 
um, that's the powerful tool that you can have within these places. Um, so again, like use a live auctioneer, somebody who can increase the engagement. Um, and there's a concept in uh, the cost silent cycle and in our uh, book that we have at Fundraising Academy called the Madden Test. Um, and that is, you know, a different way for you to qualify these prospects. Do they have the money to spend? Do they have the approachability, the desire, the decision making, uh, the emotional capacity to see the uh, organization as a place to support and the need? Um, so in terms of uh, the database, it's so important to pay attention to it um, and try to get the most out of it. Because again, you're paying for it. You might as well try to uh, make the most advantage out of uh, the database that you have. So Sarah, if you can launch the poll, we want to learn a little bit more about your events. Uh, what type of events do you have? Um, a lot, and what is the modality in which you host your events? Are they online? Are they in person? Are they a mix of the two? Uh, what have you been doing the last few years? Awesome. Thank you, Muhi. I'm going to give folks a few seconds to fill out our poll. We would love to hear about how we can take some of Muhi's amazing advice on prospecting and stewardship and thinking through who should be invited to your event into practice. And Laura is going to go through that next about thinking through what that all means and taking the theory of cause selling into application. So thank you so much for all. I'm gonna end the poll in just a couple of seconds. All right, and I will showcase the results if Muhi would like to read them aloud. Definitely. So uh, we have 32%, pretty much a third say online, a third say, um, now I'm confused with my math. Oh, okay. We, we did allow, no worries. I understand um, the confusion. So we did allow yeah, so participants people could multiple to answers. choose okay. multiple answers, yeah. which makes sense. Um, right, so but yeah, we have some it. folks out online, some folks hybrid, but look at this large bar Majority, for um, yeah, in-person in -person. events. And I love that because my small nonprofit, we've been um, online for the last two years, and we were doing small in-person events prior to the pandemic, but we haven't gone back to in-person. So I love that a majority of people are back to in-person um, and so important for deepening those relationships. Yes, that's so great. I'm excited, Laura, for you to share some strategies then now that we know our audience is really interested in what um, relationship building can be done in person. Absolutely. Yeah. And let's be honest, it's so much better in person, right? You can only send so many Zoom chats to someone telling them you like your shirt, their shirt, and you hope they're doing well in these crazy times. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I would be perfectly fine with living through a little less history. That would be fine. Um, but one thing to think about too, I know it's easy, especially sometimes for leadership to say something like, oh, let's do hybrid. Let's do both. That's even better. Not realizing that that really means doing two of events often at the literal same time, depending on your events team and your structure, you may not have the bandwidth to do that. You may be able to instead think about recording a live event and putting it online for folks or leaning straight into the online piece because you've, you've learned now because of COVID that you have um, constituents around the country who'd be able to come to an online event that wouldn't be able to come to one in person. So you want to think about that. So that gets us here on the first part about knowing your audience. We want to make sure that you're setting your event into a way that's going to make a difference for the folks who you're inviting. Um, you want to invite specific people, not just a wide net. I know we all like to think that you're going to post your event online, it'll be sold out in a day, but rarely is that what really happens. Um, I know for us right now, we're going to launch a new event and we've got some um, key folks who are part of the demographic that we're looking to attract that we're floating the whole event by you know is this something you and your friends would come to is this something you'd potentially share does this sound like the right kind of event for this group of movers and shakers to, to get them engaged with the zoo and the safari park in a new way 
While you're doing this, you also want to set your goal. What is your real purpose? Now, this can be financial. This can be numbers-based with regards to including new demographics into your um into your circle, or it can be something about, you know, we want to steward the folks who've been with us through COVID and celebrate them. And so maybe it doesn't have the same kind of financial target that it might um, for your gala or something like that. So do think about that and think about what's meaningful and what's true. Like, yes, we're all trying to raise money, but is that really the event? goal here or is it really about that touch and that as a result after the event you're going to be able to make a whole bunch of asks that you couldn't do prior because now they're more connected with you. Next you want to choose the right type of event. So I, I talked about this a little bit um, but beyond online versus hybrid versus in person you also want to make sure that your event reflects your culture and your mission of your organization. You know culture and cocktails some, sounds like a great thing but maybe not for you know a more conservative organization or um, that you want to make sure that if you're stepping into new territory that it's something that will resonate with the folks that you're interested in. With that too is budgets, right? I know, I know for us, we're trying to keep a flat budget as we plan for 2023, but as we know, literally everything got more expensive. So do we still wanna do a plated dinner? Do we wanna do heavy hors d'oeuvres? Is there a different way of looking at our budget that would allow us to um, still give people a great experience, but also keep our costs in line? You know, if we all held unlimited budgets, it'd be amazing, but that's a situation few of us find ourselves in. So number four here, we want to think creatively, think outside the box. And I think that's something that COVID really has helped push us to do more of. Um, I, I know with the zoo, you know, we always want to feature leadership, but leadership tells me over and over that when they're in the room with, you know, somebody who's a polar bear researcher, all the donors want to do is talk to that person. So for all that we want to have leadership at our events, we're really leaning into the science and the research and helping people feel connected to the work we're doing personally so they leave feeling like they learned something they didn't know already. With this too, you want to think about engaging your beneficiaries in a meaningful way. You want to say thank you, and you want to do that appropriately. Um, you, you want to be sure that if you've got an event that's celebrating your, you know, the new facility you're opening, that the appropriate donors are um, thanked and acknowledged in the ways that both they've been promised. And maybe it's the opportunity to, to surprise and delight. Maybe you are going to surprise your biggest donor and actually have them do the groundbreaking at this event that they think is a celebration. Um, that said, know your donor, right? Some folks don't like surprises. So be careful about anything that you plan that it's going to really impact your folks the way you want them to. Um, we're back to the budget. This is huge. So you, you can Keep in mind that you know spending a lot of money on things, people know, and we're, we are nonprofits. So all of our donors always wanna know that we're using funds for the furthering of our mission and that we're not doing you know, maybe a gold-plated lobster dinner that, that is an extravagance. Um, one way around this though too, is if you have underwriters. So you might have, um, I, I was with an organization that there was one of our women on our committee who underwrote our wine because she didn't want to drink the wine we could afford. And you know, thank you to her. And so we put that on everything. So folks weren't gonna be upset that we spent too much money on wine because they knew it was already subsidized. Next is your invitation. You want to stand out. You know, I think um, online invitations are great, but something about actually opening the mailbox to something that you go, oh, look at this. You want to have a compelling invitation that is exciting and gets people really jazzed up to be part of what you're doing. Make sure you look at the calendar for your community in advance that you're not going to accidentally um, choose to have your gala on the same night as, you know, another big name in town. Um, one way you can you can help open that door for folks is including early bird pricing and benefits. You know, buy now and you get eight tickets for the price of six or whatever it is. Um, you also want to make sure that folks have the chance to give in addition to the ticket price so they can support your organization with an additional gift if they're interested. Um, you also can have social media tags so people can share that they're coming to your event. Maybe your event's on Facebook and they're going to say they're interested or that they're going. They're going to share it with their friends that way. 
Um, you can include attire suggestions. Of course, your location, the timeline, summary of the program, get them excited. I also wanna be careful though, don't overdo it. You don't want your invitation to um, overwhelm. I know for, for us, we do a, an, an overview on the invitation and then once people um, sign up, they get a thank you that includes, this event is gonna be safari chic. So bring your favorite walking shoes and your best rhino or whatever it is. Um, sorry, tomorrow's World Rhino Day, so I have them on the mind. Um, I hope you're all going to celebrate. Um, and you want to thank them once they register, and then make sure you keep them apprised. You know, maybe a week before the event, you want to send out a can't wait to see you next week email. Um, and think also about the drop-off rates you know happen, depending on your organization for a paid event versus a free event, et cetera. You want to be creating a dynamic experience. You want to inspire them. You know, we're in the nonprofit space. A lot of us deal with some really hard issues and our special event might be our best time to get to share the joy of that with our donors. So make sure that you have those joy moments that folks are gonna leave saying, wow, that was amazing, I didn't know. I know when I worked with Girl Scouts, we always had one of our older girls in high school um, share a little bit about the projects they were working on. And these girls are literally changing the world and make you feel better about the future of America. And that was a message that um, we always wanted to be sure our donors went home with. And you also want to offer them the opportunity to get involved. You know, maybe as a result of your event, you're going to get a lot of folks who want to volunteer. So keep in mind those kinds of opportunities you'll be able to offer as a next step to bring them into the organization closer. And then last but not least is promoting your event. Don't forget that you need to do this. Put it on socials, get, you know, do ads if that's what you do. We had an, an organization who donated billboards to us every year. So there'd be billboards about our events. You can be creative. And then you want to make sure you're promoting your sponsors early and often. This is what they're here for. They want that um, notoriety in the very best sense. So make sure that all of the goodwill that's coming with your event rubs off on your donor, or your sponsors, excuse me. Next up is during the event. So keep it moving. I'm starting at the bottom here because this is important. Nobody comes to an event and wants to be speechified at all night. Literally no one wants that. So that may mean you need to help cut down the person you know is gonna go over on their talking point. Um, I'll, I'll go back to the top though. First, you wanna start with your seamless check-in. This is something that you need to run a tight ship. I know um, for us with the San Diego Zoo, we have our development officers circulating around where our registration is. So they can come up with a donor and say to the registration desk person, oh, Susie, here's Mr. and Mrs. what have you. They're so excited to be here tonight. That kind of special touch makes people feel so great. It also helps if you've got someone who knows your board members. Your board members might be expecting you know what they look like. So having someone floating around who can say, oh, here's our board chair. Here, let me help you. That extra special touch can make a big difference. Um, you want to keep your staff circulating during the event as well. If you have a reception time, they should be checking in with folks, making sure they're having a great time. And um, this is a place where with connecting with your with your prospects, this is something that we do a lot of research and share. So for instance, the gala we had not too long ago, we paired a staff member up with every exec team member who would take them to the different tables so that we could thank Mr. So-and-so from the board chair, from the CEO for being there tonight. So that staff member was the one who ha had the details, um, but we sent it out ahead of time. So our CEO knew that they were being paired with Natasha and Natasha was gonna take them through these six tables and they were going to thank these people for these things. But for keeping track night of, it was Natasha who knew where those tables were, what those people looked like, and what they needed to be thanked for. So keep these thoughts in mind of how you can partner people and prepare them for success so they can feel really special. Our last gala too, our co-chairs went around to every table and thanked people for being there. We heard from guests more than ever how special they felt, especially because it was our first event back in two years. So it was a really meaningful way for people to feel like they were part of the evening. I love again, that, Laura. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to no, interrupt ahead. you. I just wanted to share so much how I love the strategy that you're talking about, about pairing a staff member with um, a board member so that they know who to look for, what table they're sitting at, because a lot of this prep work, and I know a lot of us on the call will um, understand this, is that 
fundraising and relationship building starts far before the event. So we are on the slide talking about during the event, but the things that Laura is speaking about are all things that you can do and strategize for to make sure that those key touch points happen during the event versus just saying, oh, you know, circulate around board members or circulate around these tables. We really want people to get to know you having a strategy in place before and preparing your development officers and your relationship building experts on facilitating those connections is a great tool. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's something too, our exec team really congratulated us on after the event because they felt prepared, right? You don't ever want to set someone up for a situation where they feel awkward and they're just going to go up to someone and be like, hi, I'm the director of such and such and it's nice to meet you. Thanks again. Like they're not going to remember the details in the way that development officers will. And that's okay. They've got a lot of other stuff they're in charge of. So setting them up for success means a successful event and stronger relationships with your donors. Yeah. And I want to elevate this comment that came into the chat too. It's such a great idea for new staff members. I know that some of our organizations are experiencing in the last couple of years, some some turnover, to be totally fair, and some new faces to your organization that may be really excited and passionate about your mission, but haven't yet met some of your donors, whether they are big and small. So I love the idea of introducing that community at an event. That's a great point. And, you know, depending on the size of the crowd, um, we have a small support group called Ocelots. And my first Ocelot event, I was introduced at, with my title so that they knew who I was. At our gala, they're not going to take the time to say, and we're glad Laura's here now. Um, but I could, I ha did actually have a staff member take me around so they could say, oh, this is so-and-so, oh, this is so-and-so. And it makes such a difference. And it makes those donors feel so special. So let's move on to after the event, then what? So after everybody takes a nap, and by everybody, I mean your team, you want to thank your attendees, supporters, and staff. Um, you want to send out a, wow, thanks so much for being there. Because of you, we hit our goal. We're going to be able to reach this many more people or porcupines or principalities, whatever it is. Um, and I want to underline here, thanking staff. We had a 3,000 a person event last weekend. And this morning I was on a Zoom call with 60 people as the event coordinator thanked people from literally every department of the zoo, from security to food service, to our team, et cetera, to thank them for the effort they put into this. It makes a big difference. People love that, that um, public recognition from their peers. Knowing that their peers thought that they did the right thing is most people's highest reward when it comes to um, like levels of gratitude. So do think, do think about how you can think publicly and appropriately. Um, and then you want to pursue your potential relationships. This is a great chance for you to say, hey, it was so nice to meet you on Saturday. I'd love to get together for coffee or I'd love to, you know, we talked about the penguins. Let me take you on down so you can see them face to face. This is your chance. Don't lose your time here. Don't wait too long when the luster of your event is, is in their memory bank instead of in the thing that they're telling all their friends about right now. And then after every single event, you always want to examine and critique. No matter how great your event was, there's something you could do better. There's something you guys did perfectly that you want to do again. And there's some things maybe you don't want to do again. Um, so this is a place where you want to provide that space for feedback for staff, board, volunteers, vendors, whatever the appropriate group is who worked on the event. You want to make sure there's both the celebration side and the opportunity for improvement. And next, I'm very excited. I'm going to get to tell you about Ritz, which is rendezvous in the zoo. Um, I will keep in mind, obviously, the, the furry friends at the zoo are not everyone's uh, benefit at their events. But I think that these strategy and techniques are going to help you as you're figuring out what's the best way to shine a light on the great work your organization is doing. So Ritz, Rendezvous in the Zoo. Um, it's almost our 50th year of this event. So it is beloved. And we, we, this was our first year back after two years of hybrid and online only. So it was a really big deal that we blew the top off of it for our guests. So before we started, we came up with our overall strategy points here. 
First, to re-engage, steward, and cultivate major donors who this is their favorite event. We have so many folks who don't go to anything in town anymore, but they always come to Ritz. And so we want to be really thoughtful about ensuring that we continue to, number two here, produce an event guests enjoy. They come for fun. They come for the Tamandua aardvark there. Um, they come for the opportunity to celebrate with friends, have amazing food, and help save the critters. It is a feel-good event and the best party in town. I love that aardvark. I think that uh, when we talked about the event flow and keeping it moving, just look at the joy on those faces. You talked about joyful moments, and I think with the crowd here pursuing in-person events or hybrid events, how can you share that joy and how can you share that excitement that your donors are experiencing far beyond the event? Great stuff. And Thank you. Here's the challenge is like, not everybody works at the zoo. Like how, how fortunate is the zoo to have like this beautiful experience that um they can create with their venue and with their setting and all of those things but really look at like what is the beneficiary and impact that your mission has and allow yourself and your events team um, to really curate the experience and give lots of thought to what is the impact that these donors are going to have on our beneficiaries and how can you connect the dots? Um, so, you know, as fantastic as the zoo experience is, the, the take home is what is the mission that you have? Why are you so passionate about working at your organization? And what is the experience and leave behind feeling that you can create for your donors as well? Absolutely. Thank you, Muhi. I mean, it's true. I wanted to work at the zoo for 20 years. And as I suspected, some things are easier here. Um, but there are really great ways to do this, no matter what your organization is. Um, as an example, again, with Girl Scouts, we would put, they, they had sort of science boards that these older girls did on their gold award projects. And so they, the girls would present about what they were doing to impact anti-human trafficking or to work on um, social causes in their school and things like that so that donors left going wow I didn't know they're doing these great things I went to an event not long ago and they had um, a client family who had been served by the organization in some really rough circumstances shared their story and those kind of things make an impact for folks so um, figure out what the fuzzy warm feel good is for you whether or not you have charismatic mammals that you can bring as part of the show yeah with the Ritz overall strategy slide we see here Laura's two main points are just to re-engage steward and cultivate major donors and produce an event that guests enjoy. You can do that with any type of mission, right? I love the idea of asking yourself, what is your organization's mission moment? What is your impact? What is your meaningful experience? Um, to answer these two or to, to look at these two overall strategy goals with any type of organization. Absolutely. Thank you. This is just a point we we wanted to sh I wanted to share about relationships. Since this is about relationship-based fundraising. So more tickets were sold following our save the date email than the actual formal invitation mailing, which just goes to show that our crowd loves the Ritz and couldn't wait for it to come back. Um, but those, the majority of in attendees are invited by and interact with our development team. So we've got philanthropy officers who knew these six couples wanted tables to Ritz before they were even on sale. Um, with that, in 2021, when we did a smaller in-person event simultaneous with an online event, which may or may not be why I feel that hybrid is more work, um, all 200 guests were personally invited by our philanthropy team. So it's the relationships that they have with our folks that are why they got were reached out to and wanted to be part of this special night. And, and then we know with our group, we have at least 50 folks, many of whom purchase tables, who actually schedule their travel around Ritz. Like they're going to Europe in, in July instead of June because Ritz is always the same weekend in June. So we know that. We're not going to make adjustments to the, our calendar. We're not going to move our date. We're not going to do things like that without a really thoughtful consideration of what impact it's going to make on the folks who already love this event. 
So then once we were done after our amazing celebration, we took a look at revenue, of course. Um, so we reviewed these revenue categories over the past five years. So we could show a real trend, especially because we've had leadership shift over the last two years or so, plus COVID. So there's been a lot of change. And so we wanted to demonstrate that the, the event was still the caliber and quality it has been. So we took the regular revenue categories, you know, some years we had a silent auction, some years we didn't, some years we had a powder race, some ways we didn't. So we kept that all in mind. But then what we did is we included our guest count. Um, our footprint changed. The place where we do this event on the zoo grounds um, was reimagined, repurposed, and there's now a new restaurant in part of it. So we could fit 200 less people than we used to fit. So we had our guest count on there, and then we did a little math to figure out our average revenue per guest. So with this, we were able to demonstrate that we had a per guest ROI of $1,400, which is really high. You're, that's, not, that's not the point here. The point is that this was at the high end of our range. When we did this five-year comparison, this was our second to highest year yet. And so that was a great way for us to show our, our board and our exec team that this was the right kind of event. It was executed near flawlessly and that our donors were engaged to the lo best level they ever have been or in, in the highest levels. That was a huge piece for us. However, the bottom line is not our only success measure. So number one here, we stewarded and cultivated our major donors in a deep way. That was our goal, right? That's what we wanted to do. This is what we heard over and over from our donors about how engaged they were, how much fun they had. I mean, we had notables there, elected officials. The mayor comes, but he tries to stay under the radar, which is a little bit funny because everybody knows our mayor. Um, but it's not, he, he doesn't, like he comes because it's a fun party and he wants to come. Um, our guests dance the night away. There were people on the dance floor from 8 p.m. to midnight, period, um, even in the middle of the, the pontificating. So it is a fun party. It's and so we have, it's true. You would have, Mohi. <laughs> you would love it. It's really fun. Um, and the, so we, we created wows, you know, when folks walked into the space, we transformed it. It's a, just a big open flat space basically, but not anymore. Um, so the, the guests all had an amazing time. They felt special. They felt that they were part of us. They felt that family feel that is why they love the zoo and why they want to come back again next year. So as you're looking at your successes, don't just measure with money. And it's easy for us to fall into that. You know, we love metrics, we love dollars, and that's an important piece, of course. But did you also do what you intended? Was it a fun night? Did people feel better about their relationship afterwards? Did, did you hit whatever your one or two goals are? Did you reach those? Don't forget to measure your success quantitatively, but also qualitatively. I love that, Laura. I think it's so important to underscore. And I, I see another comment here in the chat from our amazing trainer, LaShonda Williams, saying, way to go, Laura, and making a case for support using ROI to justify another event. I think that's so smart when we're talking about event strategy. We're talking about successes, whether they are qualitative or quantitative. And even your thoughtful approach on figuring out what the average revenue per guest is. I think that helps a lot of our guests here with um, different varying sizes of organization. Maybe you're not throwing a gala like the Ritz, uh, the Ritz event at the zoo, but maybe when you divide the total, you know, total revenue of your event by the number of individuals who came, you may have a higher end ROI range than you did last year. So that's a great stat to put in front of your board, to put in front of your leadership and say, hey, this is working. And then I can follow up with these qualitative successes that focus on relationship building. This is me doing a great job as an emerging fundraising leader. So these are all things that you want to think about um, as you continue thinking through the strategy of your event before and after. So I want to one turn One more it through. point I want to oh, make. Yeah. This. I'm sorry, uh, Muhi. One more. Um, two, if you had somebody who had a table of donors or a, of guests, and some of those guests made donations to your organization, 
thank the table host too. You don't need to go into the specifics, um, but to say, wow, Sarah, thanks so much. At your table, six of your guests gave a total of X dollars. And they'll want to know which ones because they're going to want to thank them and that's fine. But don't tell them the dollar figure per person. That's private. Um, but to say, wow, because of you, we raised 6,000 more dollars from your guests that night. Make sure you have that stewardship touch and then talk with them about engaging that person because they know them better than you do. Oh my goodness, you're just speaking to my stewardship loving heart. So some <laughs> of my folks on the call know that I'm a donor relations lover and a stewardship professional. That's how I came up in the fundraising world. And I love the idea of building community within the table after the event, kind of sharing the successes with your donors to make them feel like part of your team and really to steward that relationship, but to build on to Muki's point about centers of influence and referrals and how you can take that further um, by building community. So thank you so much, Laura, for sharing about the Ritz. And I want to go ahead and kick it off to um, Muki to talk about a different type of event since we have different modalities that were described in our poll. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Laura, I've learned so much in these slides and thank you so much for providing such a wonderful example um, of what you can do and how you can do it really well. Um, you know, with the Muslim Philanthropy Awards at American Muslim Community Foundation, we had this idea of really replicating what Association of Fundraising Professionals does for Philanthropy Day um, and making it more niche within the Muslim community. Um, and it was a fantastic opportunity over the last two years for us to bring this to the community as well. Um, so just a little bit more on like what that looked like. So pre-event, um, you know, we had a nomination process for the awards, um, promoting the fact that people can be nominated for 10 different award categories from um, youth and philanthropy to uh, board member to nonprofit to corporation um, and so on so forth. Um, best fundraiser, best um, you know staff member, and all of these things. Uh, best volunteer fundraiser. So we wanted to encourage the community all across the country to nominate different people. Um, we established a host committee. They were so critical in helping us connect with other sponsors nationally. Uh, helping us connect with um, the community. We knew that this event was going to be virtual because the first time we did it was in uh, 2020. Um, so with the pandemic uh, really in full swing, uh, we planned this event for the end of the year. It also launched our year-end campaign for fundraising. Uh, so we timed it in November. Um, and then we were able to do a silent auction as well. And there were a lot of sponsorship opportunities. Um, we were able to connect with foundations that had given us past support. We were able to connect with other community organizations that wanted um, exposure to our email list of 16,000 people of our home addresses of 10,000 people. So over the last you know, five years since we had started AMCF in 2016, we were able to collect a lot of data and then use that data to then reach out to sponsors to get in front of those donors as well. Um, and then creating a unique program, different topics on donor, um, best practices for donors, best practices for nonprofit organizations. So we had a program aspect to it, along with entertainment, with uh, live poetry, with live music, with comedy, um, so it was more of a lighthearted feel and take on the event, different than just your average fundraiser. Um, and during the event, we had a platform called VFairs. It was different than your typical Zoom. It allowed people to engage with participants in a different way in a virtual setting to go into a specific room uh, where there were um, sponsor booths. Um, and people could download information from the different sponsors. The sponsors would then receive information of who came into the uh, booth um, and then their information would be shared with that sponsor. So again, the platform that you use provides a unique experience for um, these hybrid or virtual events. Um, and having somebody like Hassan Minhaj was so critical for us. This was um, right after he was done with the Patriot 
act show and before he was on the morning show. So there was a little bit of buzz around that. Um, and he posted it on his social media to promote our event. Um, and then again, we had a silent auction during the event. And this is me re-watching the, the uh, event as well. Um, and just totally geeking out on the fact that I got to interview Hassan Minaj. Oh my gosh, um, <laughs> that's the coolest. I sorry to interject, but I think um, you don't have any reason to say we don't have aardvarks um, when you have a, an MC <laughs> like that. Um, I love the creative idea of utilizing what is part of your community and what makes you joyful and what makes you have an impact 100%. in your event in a new modality. Like you whether or not you're, um, uh, this is speaking to everyone on the call, just whether or not your mission is focused on um, endangered species or it's focused on a community that is traditionally underrepresented in philanthropy, yeah. this is where you want to celebrate. This is where we want to uplift those voices or uplift those animals' stories or uplift your, um, you know, the population you serve, their stories, to bring them to a big, greater audience to get folks excited about the joy that comes with whatever um, whatever mission that your organization has. Definitely. And, and, you know, we have a small budget. We're an organization whose operating budget is around $175,000, $200,000. So we created, uh, you know, in 2020, this event with Hassan Minaj. And really that was our publicity, right? We, that was like, people wanted to hear from him. And we just talked about his thoughts on philanthropy, how he gives, why he gives, who he gives to. And it was just an honest conversation around the principle of zakat and sadaqa in Islam. Um, so it was really unique to hear that perspective from a comedian, from an actor, from somebody who is well known in the community um, and in the general pop culture as well. Um, so for us, we created a budget around that. It allowed us to get larger sponsorships. We raised about $55,000 in sponsorships in 2020. Um, and we were around 60,000 in 2021. Um, and we didn't have a big name like Hasan Minaj in 2021, but that experience of having 500 virtual attendees in our event um, really allowed us the opportunity to create bigger packages and uh, push forward this platform that was really engaging. Um, and, you know, our goal for the end of the year was to raise $100,000. And in 2020, we hit that goal. Um, you know, in 2021, uh, we got very close. We, we got around like uh, $89,000. So we fell short on our goal. Uh, but a majority of fundraising in the Muslim community happens within Ramadan. So we were able to exceed our goal the following year in Ramadan and make up for it. So a lot of unique things within a smaller community of how the event experience looked, of how it worked. Um, and we just had to be creative with the, the resources that we had. Um, and you know, we're thinking of what is our next Muslim Philanthropy Awards going to look like. Um, and we have such a small staff that, you know, we we've hired an executive director, we've hired a part-time a donor manager, a nonprofit manager, uh, but we are kind of like rebuilding our organization from the ground up. And what we decided was let's postpone the 2022 Muslim Philanthropy Awards and actually push it into Ramadan to maximize our fundraising efforts at that time. So that's the plan. Uh, we'll start planning it momentarily. We're focusing on year-end fundraising now and what that looks like. So the other thing is just be flexible with your organization's capacity. Uh, so that's really where we're at. I think that's so smart. And I love, I'm going to uplift another comment in the chat that's just like, way to go, Wuhi. It's a wonderful virtual community event maximizing resources. So if there's anything that um, our audience can take away is that there's a way to maximize your resources, no matter how small or large your organization is, no matter what modality you choose. And that's why we have, you know, all these different steps in the cost selling cycle and um, movies amazing um, beginning slides that talk about what prospecting looks like and how you can build upon year over year. And, and you know, Laura's point about um, the ROI year over year, looking back five years, looking forward at quantitative and qualitative, all of these things are strategic 
points that you can take into your everyday work. So thank you both for sharing this amazing example. And Muhi, I want to sure. kick it off to you to add any last yeah. comments before we, we transition into our next section of this webinar. Definitely. And, and the one thing I would say is like, as a co-founder, as a director of development and philanthropy, it was a hard pill for me to swallow to postpone this event because it's like, we've done it for two years. It's been super successful. Like I want to knock it out this year in 2022 and re-engage those donors that we've had. And like, without this award, can we have a successful year in campaign? These are hard conversations to have with your staff, with your board. Uh, but ultimately, you know, it's their decision and what they want to do. And I have to be uh, respectful of that. So it's like, okay, let's postpone it and kill it when it happens. So I'm super stoked to have the support of the board, of the staff to redefine what it looks like. Um, and it may not happen with how I originally intended it to, but I can let my ego aside for the best thing of the organization that I helped build and love. Um, so that was a hard pill to swallow, but also a growing pain that our small organization has to focus our resources internally because this year we're doing an audit, we're doing uh, our CRM rebuild, we're doing so many other things to build the processes to make our organization stronger, um, and I can't get in the way of that. So we're working with our development committee uh, to create a year-end strategy that will hopefully be successful. And, um, you know, that's where we are and where we, uh, this moment in our organization's growth and trajectory um, will hopefully be the right decision that the board made. And I'm fully on board with it and something that I'm equally excited about. You know, we may need to taper our year-end goal on from 100K down to 50K or something like that, but it'll at least give us the opportunity to make a larger goal of usually 150k in Ramadan to hopefully 200 or even 250k and really dream big of what that looks like for the organization. So that's how these event goals can really make or break an organization. You know, time will tell how uh, how this affects the organization long term, but I'm fully committed to to doing what I can and what I have in my capacity to make this successful as a co-founder. So yeah. I will. That's beautiful. There. I think yeah. it's good. I think, um, and what we can move to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about um, moving us into our next portion, which will be the Q and A. So if you want to go ahead and put your questions in there, guests um, for our amazing experts here, um, Laura and Muhi. But I did want to note for, for everyone that I love Muhi's comment about just being flexible. And also I want to add giving yourself grace, giving your team grace. Laura talked about thanking your staff team as part of your stewardship efforts. That's a huge, huge deal. And as someone who has um, been a part of a smaller nonprofit, I, I used to work for the Make-A-Wish Foundation chapter in San Diego, small team, just like Muhi's describing, and then used to work at a huge shop at UC San Diego, like Laura's talking about her um, experience with large boards, large committees, huge events at the zoo. I can relate to both of those areas and say that in every aspect of donor um, relationship building fundraising with donors is that giving grace and receiving grace is incredibly important in our industry. And when it comes to event strategies, if you are grounded in the strategy and you are grounded in the principles of why you are making decisions, that's going to make your event successful. So um, with that, I want to transition us into the Q&A section. So if you have any questions for our incredible presenters, please put them in the Q&A or in the chat. We are, um, flexi we are flexible there as well, where we receive your inquiries. Um, but wanted to talk about our webinar series again. Thank you for all joining um, and making sure that uh, we continue to have incredible content for you at Finding News Academy. So um, I'm going to also promote one of our wonderful um, chat participants, LaShonda Williams, will actually be um, the trainer on our next webinar coming on up, up in October, mm -hmm. um, where we're going to continue our relationship building strategies. I'm going to pop a link in the chat for the next Fundraising Academy webinar, um, and then we'll move into Q&A. So um, while we're waiting for folks to add any questions, if you have any, also there, there aren't many questions right now because Oh my goodness, Laura and Muhi had such great information that maybe we've covered everything. Um, but I actually have some questions of my own. Um, so I will go ahead and begin with those. 
Um, all right. I, I also see. do see one in the Q&A. Oh, there we so, go. Yes, so let, we've got let's one. Let's get there first, and you can queue yours up as well, Sarah. Yes, we have um, all the things. We want to utilize all the wonderful expertise that you and Laura bring to the table. For sure. So I and, have a question from, oh, sorry, Muhi, did you have something? No, nope, okay. go ahead. All right, question away. from Lisa. How do you steward sponsors as prospects? That's a great question. Laura or Muhi, feel free to answer. That is a great question. Um, I think the the biggest piece is, is timeliness, um, especially your corporate sponsors. They have specific times of year when they do their grant making and you want to make sure that your event, that you get your ask in in the right time so that you can be part of their budget for that next year. Um, something I hear over and over from corporations is that they're not supporting events anymore, but then they give a, say a $25,000 gift to support a program and they want the recognition at the event because that's where the people are, right? So figure out the way for your organization to maybe bundle your asks to to a corporation so that maybe they're supporting 25,000 for this and 15 for this and 10 for that. So now they're a 50k donor and you would love to highlight them on the event invitation. You want to have these conversations with whoever your uh, point person is with that organization, corporation, foundation, etc. Um, but ensuring that you're giving them the visibility that they're looking for, celebrating the good work. You know, if you're going to have a, a client story and it's a program that was sponsored by the local utility or whatever it is, you know, you can say, we're so excited to share so-and-so's story and thank you again, SDG and E for supporting our safe harbor project or whatever it is. You can integrate it throughout the night. You want to have logos um, on signage at the event. Um, there's lots of different ways, but you also want to make sure that the way that make sense to that sponsor. Um, so keep in mind um, what sort of what maybe any expectations that were outlined along the way. I know for us, we have donor, excuse me, gift agreements, and they talk about, you know, what that recognition is going to look like. Um, we had, we were planning on doing a um, printed program, but then we moved to digital. And so we, we alerted our sponsors to the shift and then asked if we could also add them to the website or to a banner we were going to have at the event to make up for the, um, the, the original sort of promise of stewardship that we could then keep. Um, so there's lots of different ways, um, although I will recommend also standardizing it. Do your best to have an outline of everybody at this level gets this and everybody at this level gets that. Um, we have an airline who likes to give tickets, not money. Um, so we do it in the, we've, I've seen, I've been at events in the program where it's like, Hey, check out that Southwest ad. And if you have a star on yours, you just won two tickets. So there's lots of really creative ways that you can um, give folks that, that, um, shine a light on, on their support. Yeah. And what I'll add to that is in 2020, we did event specific fundraising benefit, uh, sponsorship benefits. So we, you know, we promoted them before, during, after the event, and that was it. In 2021, we did year-long benefit packages, adding them into our podcast, adding them into our webinar series, different ways of engaging them. Um, what we realized was that was a little bit too much, you know, it was a bit too much for us to handle as well throughout the year, providing them with uh, other opportunities and following up with them, tying loose ends. Um, it didn't necessarily work out as good as we wanted it to. However, it's just a matter of your staff's capacity, how that looks, um, and what that um, stewardship um, looks like. I think we can still go back to the sponsors from the last two years and re-engage them, um, but we have kept them abreast with our organization, being on our email newsletter and, and things like that. So we need to do a better job ourselves of maintaining those relationships. And that's something that we, we are committed to doing. Actually, that's that's a good point, Louie, about thinking through what the maintenance of a maintenance of a sponsorship relationship looks out throughout the year. So I think it ties into Laura's answer about stewarding your sponsors as prospects, you know, right after the event or during the event, coming up with creative ways to mention them to the large audience that you have at the moment. But I love Mookie's idea of like, what does that look like in stewarding them as a prospect, not during event time? We all know that, you know, donors aren't going to necessarily, um, 
respond well to someone's like, oh, you know, I'm just, I never come to you. I never talk to you about anything, but like right before our event, I was wondering if I could get an ad. Like that's not necessarily a great strategy, but something that we talk often about in relationship driven fundraising at Fundraising Academy throughout all of our programs is how can you be thoughtful about building um, connections with people during times at which it's not necessarily like you need something right away. Um, you're playing a longer game here with some of the sponsors. So I would just um, offer to Lisa that to think about that strategy of stewardship throughout the year. And I'm really um, focused on something that I think often about is like stewardship strategies that go further, right? What does it mean to go further than um, the next gala down the street when you come up with how do I thank this donor? If it's maybe standardizing with a stewardship postcard, but then you write as a development officer, thank you so much for your sponsorship this year, like loved working with you in a handwritten portion of that, maybe that's it. So maybe you can combine some standardized processes and mailings, but also with a personal touch. And then the I'm other gonna, thing to consider- oh, sorry. Sorry, but, um, was just like staff turnover at some of these other places, right? So like making sure, you know, team members get introduced to others, provide handoffs, like all of those things are so critical uh, for the next year coming around. I just wanted to add one personalized um, thanking strategy, Sarah, you you triggered a memory. Um, at one gala uh, at another organization I worked for, we wrote thank you notes to our corporate sponsors. We knew, you know, that it was Sarah who was representing Fundraising Academy or whatever it was. We had them at check-in. So when they got their lanyard, they also got a thank you note. And we received the best feedback from that. And folks just were thrilled with the extra level of attention. So be creative. Yeah, people love a, a, a creative stewardship strategy. And Muhi, that even, I, I love our collaboration here team. Um, Muhi, talking about providing handoffs and staff changes, think thoroughly through, you might have hand, you might have staffing changes at your a nonprofit organization, or um, there also might be staffing changes at the sponsoring organization. So you wanna be open and available to um, welcoming that new staff at sdg &E or welcoming that new staff at um, the other large, corporate sponsor that you have to say, hey, we like love working with your organization. Like in the past, we worked with Muhi, but I'm so excited to meet you, Laura, and um, continue this partnership for the, the next year. So that's also a great way to differentiate yourself as a, as a fundraiser who is focused on relationship building and not just the on paper corporate sponsorship. Awesome. Are there any other questions? I want to make sure that I've gotten all other inquiries. If um, others in the room would like to add their questions to the chat or Q&A, feel free. But I have a personal, I have a question for both of our panelists since I have you here. Um, I was curious about, um, maybe this resonates with some folks in our audience that have an annual um, event calendar. And so um, how do you decide when to do something different with your annual event calendar? And I'll actually pair it into an anonymous question we just got. We have, since golf tournaments were mentioned, do you have any advice for someone who is running one for the first time? So maybe this is a new staff, new staff member we talked about. They always do an annual event and that annual event is a golf tournament. How do you know when to do something different? How do you bring your own spin, but also you're new at the organization? I think the biggest thing here is ask for help. Um, That's a great to tip. Supervisor, <laughs> talk to your volunteers. Talk to those who have been part of this in the past to find out what their recommendations are. Was there a debrief last year um, about what went well and what didn't? Can you look at those notes? Do you have a volunteer team who's on hand? Are there recommendations? Are there, you know, other organizations in town doing this that you can go see what theirs is and see if there's good ideas you might want to borrow? Um, I, I, I did, I brought up golf tournaments with an asterisk just because it's, it's one of those things that I think I've been so many places where some board member will say, oh, we should have a golf tournament. And, um, yes, golf tournaments can be amazing. You can have somebody at every hole who's giving, you know, a little bit of your mission. You can have some great 19th hole opportunities, um, but make sure that you've got clear expectations and everybody's roles are really well defined. That's going to help and help you be successful. So you can go the, the long route on this. That's a great, great tip. I even elevated it in the chat for those of us who are tuning in and not able to, um, hear everything that we're saying so clearly, but we can all do a better job of asking for help. Your volunteer base, your community 
can be a huge resource for, for us, our anonymous attendee asking about the golf tournament, because they are likely the folks who have volunteered year over year for like, you know, the tee off or, you know, whatever area of the golf tournament, they probably know very well how to run that portion of the event in a really strategic way. Um, and they may even know some of your donors as volunteers. So like, that's a great way to build connection. Are there any yeah, other and, thoughts? Maybe? And network in your business chamber, your local business chamber, oh, all of those places tip. will want to be sponsors on different polls and, and things like that. Yeah, I've never chamber personally is great. planned one myself, but I, I've attended and um, it's always great to see the sponsor opportunities in them. And yeah, they're a fun time. So. Yeah. And like local, great way to engage local businesses. They also may also have some previous connections that they're like, oh yeah, you know, year over year, we worked with so-and-so on your staff, but we didn't hear from them last year. Like that's another opportunity for you to build connection as a new member of your organization or a new person who's had the, um, had the directive to plan a golf tournament. You can reinvigorate some of those donor relationships. Um, another question we have here from an attendee who asks, what are additional ways to engage event attendees post event besides just the thank you note? Yeah, I think these are people who um, may be able to host salons and house parties and things in the future, especially if they gave at a certain level or more. Um, so, you know, just off the top of my head, thinking of having donor meetings with those people, um, making, moving them along the prospecting journey and, and getting them to become a monthly donor, a major donor and so on and so forth. So it's really that cycle of like, you know, that's their way into your event. What's their way, uh, what's the way that you keep engaging them in your organization, so yeah. Yeah, I like the thinking, cyclically there. So we talked mm -hmm. about the cause selling cycle early in this webinar. And to that um, to that attendee who asked that question, I would I would gather maybe look at the end of that cycle. We talked about how the event can be prospecting, the event can be um, part of the approach. And we talked about stewardship a little bit with our thank you notes. But that cycle is a cycle for a reason. It's a cycle because you want to bridge the gap between after that thank you note, how do you come to a strategic um, idea for engaging that person based on what you learned about them at the event. So maybe you've learned that they do really, um, maybe do have a, a home or a property where they would really love to host a salon event. Or maybe you did learn that like, oh, they probably want to buy a table at our next event. So there's a reason that it's a cycle that it goes around and around. Laura, do you have any thoughts on how to engage folks post-event? Yeah, you know, at your event, I'm sure you talked about your strategic initiative, whatever the priority is that's coming next, or that's the biggest deal that you've got going on for your organization, calling them and asking for their thoughts on it. Ask if you can get together and discuss more or what's coming next with this capital project or this program you're launching or your annual support. And, you know, we're, we're coming across to your end and we really want to make sure our donors know this. Um, give them that personal touch. Ask them you know you can always ask what they thought of the event and how it went and what we could do better next year careful though that if you ask for advice they may expect you to take it um so sometimes we have to manage bad ideas um you can always say oh that's great i'll take that back to the team and that might be the end of it um but really like for us we launched um elephant valley at ritz um elephant valley is coming to the safari park groundbreaking this year um the lead donor was there but we have plenty of money left to raise and so you know, maybe it's my chance to give my top 10 donors who are somewhat interested in Elephant Valley but haven't supported it yet to call and say, hey, we have a groundbreaking coming out. I'd love to have you there. Or I want to make sure you get to see this really cool thing that we're going to do with the elephants. Use it as a special tool and, a, and as a touch opportunity for that cycle. Again, that wherever you are on that cycle that you can move towards cultivation towards the next ask for them. You can do needs discovery on what else they need to know before they they're willing to support Elephant Valley or whatever. Um, or, you know, that it's your stewardship. Thank you. Wow. Did you see how excited people were about Elephant Valley? We're so grateful to you. So whatever level they're at, you can use the, the event as a leverage point for that next step. Yeah, that's a great, I, I love all these examples. And I'll offer a couple more from my experiences. Previously, um, I used to work for UC San Diego. We had a, a successful capital campaign in which we built a new building for the social sciences. And, and that building was going to hold 
you guessed it, programs. And so at the at the um, grand opening of the building, that became an opportunity for us to then leverage folks to say, hey, you know, welcome to the building. We're so excited to have this unique space on campus. These are some of the programs that are going to be in the space. And so using those leverage points that Laura talked about, connections on what you might learn that they might want to support in the future, those smaller programs within a space as well. So I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. Thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you, Muhi, for popping up the last slide in our um, webinar. It's a connection slide. You will get a, a copy of this deck for all of our attendees. But those are the LinkedIn channels for Muhi and Laura. We would love for you to connect with our um, amazing presenters today. Um, and make sure if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to them, reference this webinar so they know where you came from and build that relationship. And we are so, so glad to have all of you um, and all your amazing participation. So have a great rest of your Wednesday, everyone. And thank you for joining. See you later.